Welcome everybody to our cultural teaching tonight. Lexi Rick Two Dogs. Lexi, it's all yours. All right. Okay, um so uh I uh, most of this will be uh like oral. I don't have I won't have no uh I guess other pictures and did this uh, and what I know is was handed down to me orally uh, by uh, my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, my mother, and my uncle Joe Chips. So, uh, and various medicine men also. Uh, the protocol of of any uh, medicine person, uh, any holy man, uh, is they talk about uh, the story, the history of uh, the uh, the history of the uh, the ceremonies, the history of the people, the history of the spiritual uh, way of life. Uh, so beginning in each ceremony, if you understand the language, which at that time, uh, probably 99% of the people there, if not 100% of the people in these ceremonies, I was growing up uh, with all, everybody was, uh, everybody was fluent in the language, uh, or even pro or you would say proficient in the language. And so uh, the stories of these, the pipe, the sacred pipe and how it came to us uh, was all done in these ceremonies because you can't just sit down in the ceremony and go into the ceremony. The, uh, the medicine man or the healer, the holy man will talk about uh, his a connection to this way of life and the connection to his bloodline, which is the bloodline is very important. So uh, the people that at that time lived, if you spoke, uh, say, if I was to say, I had a grandfather named Crow Good Voice, who was a medicine man or a holy man or a healer, then there'll be people in there, elder people will say, yes, I remember him. And some would even go as far as to say, yeah, I seen him doctor or I seen him heal this woman that had this affliction or this sickness. So there was people there to verify uh, and validate what you were talking about. And even them, uh, the holy men and the, even the holy women uh, were, were also um, able to validate this thing. So when these uh, holy men and holy women uh, talked about their ancestors. Then there was sometimes older people in there that knew these people or else their grandparents or parents told them about these people. Mm -hmm. So that connection was strong and we've lost that. We've lost that ability to validate these things because today there's people that past themselves as holy men and holy women that have no uh, connection to a bloodline in this way. Uh, so now we are starting to uh, drift, like we're, we're drifting like in the ocean with, it's like we're drifting on a ship with no captain and no way to guide the ship. And it's kind of getting out of control. So in these, in these ceremonies, uh, and even to this day, uh, uh, holy men will talk about uh, certain healings and certain, uh, certain things that they seen or their ancestors did uh, that in order to tell the people about the history of of this way of praying and how old it is. So uh, the story goes with the bringing of the Chinupa is there was two hunters out looking 
and uh, they were looking for game because it was a time of famine among our people. And so uh, they were searching for food for the people and they met this uh, real beautiful uh, young woman out, out in the wilderness. And according to the story I heard of my grandfather, Thomas American Horse, and the story I heard of uh, uh, Joe Chips, my uncle, is that this woman uh, was a spiritual being. So she didn't have clothes on. She was naked. And when these men came upon her, immediately one of them had bad thoughts, sexual thoughts. And because this was a holy woman, a sacred person, uh, they, she read this uh, man's mind and said, well, go ahead and come and do what you're going to do. Uh, so in our language, she, she said, what you're thinking, do it. Uh, so he went towards her and a cloud enveloped, enveloped him from the top. And, and when the cloud lifted, the woman was still standing there. And the man was uh, laying there all like a skeleton. And then from there, some uh, snakes were wrapped around his body. And these snakes all left uh, different directions. Ka'abia iayapi, they say in our language. So uh, they say that before that time, there was no snakes. So uh, the analogy that these holy men make is that uh, there is a good and there is a bad in this world. There is a good and there is a evil. So the snakes represented the evil uh, or the reality, the realities of what we consider evil because um, a snake, you can, you can, if there's such a thing, befriend him, you know, he could be maybe sick or something in a certain situation. Uh, and you help him, you maybe nurse him back to health, but first chance to get, he's going to bite you, you know, he'll, he'll bite you and shoot venom in you because he's a snake. And that's just the way Wakantanka made him. So uh, the representation of in the worldview of the Lakota is that there is the evil that is there, just like there is the good. So even today, if, if men came upon a young woman like this, and she don't even have to be naked, uh, they, there's some that will have bad thoughts, and then there was some, some that would say, you know, what's, what's the problem? What happened? Why are you way out here, you know? Like that, and then, then then there's there's a man among us that would think bad thoughts and would take advantage of the situation and have, you know. So that's the first lesson of this chanupa, is that there is a good and there is a bad, uh, and even some people say that because anything that has power that can make life or destroy is sacred, uh, just the same way the pipe. Uh, if you misuse it, it could cause your death. It could cause you to lose your life. Even though it is a good thing and it, and it, is, a, it is a holy thing and it is a pure thing, it's the same as like the lightning that comes with the storm. Lightning uh, strikes the earth, replenishes it through its electrical power, but lightning can also kill you to take your life or to take the life of your loved ones. So the analogy of that is that it's a reality of life. And some people have this idea that the pipe is all good and nothing can ever happen, you know, like that. But it's not true in the sense that you have to respect that pipe and respect its power. And so in that way, uh, we understand that everything in life there is there is a positive and a negative in it, inside of it so that uh, so we can't you live live in this world of utopia and think that everything is perfect and good it's the same with the spirits there's they're powerful 
but there's good spirits and there's bad spirits also. There's so um, and even the good spirits, if you get them mad, they can hurt you. You know, there's instances of where they've hurt people in a ceremony. And you tell people today because their way of thinking and their worldview is different. Today, uh, they'll, there's people that will argue with you and say, no, the spirits aren't like that. No, Wakantanka isn't like that, you know, like that. But, you know, you break one of the spiritual rules and you break one of the, uh, the rules of the Chanupa or the ceremonies. Those rules have to be there so that uh, we follow that things, there's a saying that things, t all things tend towards chaos. So we have to have rules in our life to make sure that things don't get, you know, really out of hand, which is, it's, it seems like it's that way today, you know, because we have uh, people that are not uh, of Lakota blood running Lakota ceremonies, you know. And the importance of having that bloodline that you you descend from a holy person or a holy man, and this power follows the bloodline down, you know, uh, is is a concept that is lost today. So there's people that are not Lakota that are claiming to be medicine men and claiming to have ceremonies, claiming to do a weepy when it's not possible because the the power follows the bloodline and the spiritual DNA. So uh, whenever back in the day, uh, like say of a family, like the Teoshpai I come from, we were called the Matko Oyate, the bear people, because a lot of the members in within this band and this Teoshpai was uh, bear dreamers. They had got a medicine to doctor wounds and broken bones from the bear uh, the, that spiritual uh, entity so they were called the bear people so in that sense uh, when the uh, two hunters met the woman uh, and one had bad thoughts then that that cloud enveloped them she became a skeleton he became a skeleton and the snakes went from his body and they, they, were, they all went and disappeared. Some of them went into the ground. So uh, after he told her, after this happened to this man, she told him, she said, Yeah, So I'm talking kind of in the women's, uh, gender endings because it was a woman that said this and what he told this woman was what this woman told this man was this young hunter is go and tell your people to be ready because I'm bringing something to you so he said she said oh huh but he was afraid of her not only because he sensed from the beginning that she was a holy person a sacred person but she he also saw with his own eyes how uh, that this man with the bad thoughts was destroyed immediately. So um, he went home and she told him, she said, So when I am coming, there will be a black cloud that will form under the sun. And that's the signal that I'll be coming, he said, she said. So uh, they, uh, they, he went home and told him, that what he experienced and what he saw. And uh, I think nobody really knows uh, between the time the hunter went home and uh, reported meeting this woman and what happened to the other, uh, the young man, the one that turned to a skeleton. So the, how much time elapsed, people don't know, but they did set up a teepee and and this teepee was set, set, set up inside the uh, circle of the camp, but it was facing west instead of like all our teepees face east towards the rising sun. This one was uh, setting towards the west, the doorway, because that's what he told her. That's what she told him. She said, 
ठीक चमजी या पास लाता हूँ ना वियोग का ऐसा क्या ऐतवा ए अगले कुछ यू विल पुट अप अ लार्ज एंड फेस द एंट्रेंट द ओपनिंग टू द वेस्ट शी सेड सो दिस इज़ व्हाट दे डिड एंड हियर वन डे दे सॉ द क्लाउड अपीयर बिलो द सन सो दे ऑल गोट रेडी एंड द चीफ्स वेंट इनटू एंड द होली मैन वेंट इनटू द that the tipi that they set up facing west uh and so she came and she uh came from the west direction and she was walking and singing and she carried a a bundle on her back and she went around uh clockwise and, and entered the uh camp circle and then inside the camp circle she thought well, she walked clockwise all the way around back to the entrance and then she came forward to the teepee and then went around it clockwise four times then she went into the teepee and then she sat the bundle down in front of uh uh this man who was the chief of of that band there and these people were of the uh, hohoju oyate the people that are now that live at, reside at shayan river uh so uh she he sat the bundle down she sat the bundle down in front of uh this chief and then these holy men and the chief's name was khatanka wasla money uh the buffalo that walks upright that was his name so she put the bundle be, be, before him and then she said i brought this to your people because it is a time of need among your people and she said uh only the good will look at it and look upon it to i was the hanta hena echela wayankokte so she said only the good will look upon it and then uh she gave them uh, predictions one of them was the coming of the washichu one of them was the coming of the horse and one of them was the coming of five more ceremonies so up to that point we only had the inipi the sweat lodge and we had the hambalecha the vision quest but we did these ceremonies without the sacred pipe because we didn't re- we were just now at this moment receiving the sacred pipe so after that came the other five ceremonies the hunka ceremony the keeping of the soul the uh, sacred uh, sacred ball game uh a uh, hunka ceremony and the sundance so those five came afterwards uh so um she gave them instructions that no one is to look upon it unless they're a good person and she said that it was it has a spirit this pipe and whenever the hard times come upon the people she said this pipe will cry and even as recently as 1950s i heard a old man that his name was silas high elk who lives in greengrass he said he experienced hearing that pipe cry because it was a time a really a hard time among our people we we really struggled uh, we were just coming off of a tuberculosis epidemic and we were right in the middle of a polio epidemic so a lot of young people were dying and getting sick so he uh said he heard this pipe cry and so anyway they made offerings he said and a uh, medicine man came from all the reservations and they prayed together and uh their prayers must have worked because the polio at- epidemic subsided and so did the uh the tuberculosis epidemic so uh the prayers worked in that sense and the other time that it was prayed with was during the 1930s when they had a a real uh real uh strong uh a real bad drought among our people and my father and mother talk about living through that and how uh there were just swarms of grasshoppers that came and uh he said that they said that there was dust storms every day and dust blowing and most of the dust was blowing from the south from the area of nebraska 
So a lot of the topsoil of the Nebraska farmers all blew into South Dakota. And what was what was uh, strange is that all of the fronts that came all came from the South. So like now, uh, like even today, we're experiencing a front that came from the Northwest, which partly is from Canada. So that's why we had seen snow on Saturday and it was chilly the past few days. But in the 1930s, for about a one year period, uh, all of the fronts were coming from the South. So there was hardly any snow in the winter times. And it was a time of drought. So after uh, we received the sacred pipe, when she brought it inside there, uh, the people, of course, was in a time of famine. So they had nothing to give her, so to feed her. So they took a bowl of water and uh, they took sage and they uh, let her drink from this bowl. And they ran the sage across her mouth four times. So that's why today, uh, when someone comes back from a humblecha, then they do that to them. They run the sage across their mouth four times that was dipped in the water. And then they can uh, drink after that. So, and then if you notice when we have uh, ceremonies today, the Loampi or the Uipi ceremony, then we put sage in the water. That's in remembrance, in remembrance of that time she came. And they gave her a bundle of a gift of wachanga, sweetgrass, because they had nothing else to give. So uh, the, the pipe was wrapped inside of a, a buffalo calf skin. And when, when they unraveled it in front of her, uh, the pipe was made of a leg bone of a uh, the ho ho uh, Chanupa, it's called. It's the leg bone of a, a buffalo calf. And there's 12 feathers tied uh, on that uh, stem of the uh, pipe. And it, it's tied with uh, a medicine called Wahut, Wahut Kanskap Ejuta. Uh, and this, this grass never breaks. You can't break it. It's really, really hard to, uh, you can't, nobody, no, no human can grab it and break it like that. That's how strong it is. And she told him, she told him to add four scalps from their enemies to that pipe. So uh, they, which they did eventually in the following years, they didn't do it all at one time, but they did it. Uh, they got the scalp of four people, four, four of the, nations of enemies of our people uh so uh the the today those scalps are supposed to still be with that sacred pipe uh, no one has seen the bone pipe since the 1920s 1920s was the last time that people saw it and one of the men that got to hold it and pray with it was uh, was a man named john fire and he's also called Chief Lame Deer. And he died, I think, in the late 70s. But his account of it is, is the only written account of anybody seeing it up. And in, that was in the 1930s, and no one has seen it ever since. Um, so uh, he was the last to hold it and pray with it. And it was during the time of this time of the drought. So after they made prayers there, uh, the woman named Martha Bad Warrior sat in the sun all day with the pipe. Uh, and it was in a bundle. And then she held another pipe that was made out of pipe stone. And that was, she, that was out in the open. But the one that, had, that was made from the buffalo calf leg, that one was in the bundle. And they said she sat out there all afternoon as people went by and touched a bundle and prayed. Uh, and they said she took sick that evening uh, and they found out that she had a uh, heat stroke and she never recovered. She died within a month after that. She never recovered from the heat stroke. But the people say that 
that understand that and the holy men say that she gave her life in place so that the people will live through these um, pandemics and through the drought and through the uh, hunger because our people uh, were starving at that time and our people are still starving you know uh, if you go into this community i live nearby live that, that i live at nearby there's children there that haven't eaten because their parents are on drugs and alcohol so these children go around hungry and they'll take any opportunity to eat anywhere so that's why a lot of these children everybody in the world out there are all happy the young people and the children because it's summer vacation but for a lot of the young children on reservation that meal at school is their only meal and and a lot of uh, a lot of them that's their only safe haven. So those of you that work, have worked with schools or work at schools, uh, I think know you know what I'm talking about. So that's uh, what we become, you know, come to this point as as a people. So uh, it was a time of hunger then in the 1930s because of the drought and the pandemics. So that uh, uh, tuberculosis. Uh, epidemic was going full force. I mean, like it was, I would say from what I heard of my grandparents and my parents was, it was worse than COVID. There was like children being taken to the uh, tuberculosis sanatorium in uh, Rapid City and they were dying. They were bringing him back, you know, dead to the reservation. And a lot of people died. People don't know. That. I say more people died from tuberculosis on this reservation than from COVID, I think there's like 78 cases. I mean, people that died passed from this reservation, but there was, you know, thousands that died of tuberculosis. So after uh, she brought the pipe to the people and she predicted that we would get five more ceremonies and these ceremonies have all, um, have all, uh, come about and, and, and it took it didn't happen right away it took several hundred years for, for us to get all of the things that all of the ceremonies that uh, she predicted would come to us and each ceremony was part of a dream of somebody and it was a time these dreams came and these ceremonies came because it was a time of need yep. so they didn't just uh, appear one after another or all together. Just like in the on Lakota star knowledge, these, these teachings from these stars are took, you know, several hundred years to fulfill and become a part of our life. It wasn't all at, at one time, you know. So because scientists will tell you that the universe that we see up there now, the galaxy, and uh, uh, star constellations all didn't just appear. They appeared a little at a time. And each time they appeared, they brought a message and a teaching to our people. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So uh, it's a development over uh, thousands of years. But in the uh, winter count, it says a holy woman came to our people and the entry is in the year 1420. So this is what, what is documented, the time that uh, this holy uh, person brought the sacred pipe to. So if you do your mass 1420 to now, uh, I don't know how many years that is, but that's how long we've had the sacred pipe. Uh, so the, after the the pipe came, the sacred pipe, the Tehinchla Ho Ho Chanupa. Uh, then the first ceremony that came to us was the sun dance. And then all these other ceremonies fell into place till we had seven of them. But she predicted there will be seven ceremonies. So she said, you have two now uh, and you will get five more. And each ceremony re is represented by a star and the big dipper. She's we chalk you up, we chalk you up, uh, we chalk be he yohila, when she 
So that's how you say it in Lakota is each star represented uh, uh, one ceremony that was going to come to us. And each star represented one of the bands of the uh, Ocheti Shakoin. And then each star represented one of the spiritual laws that we're supposed to live by. So the Big Dipper has a lot of spiritual significance uh, to our people. So, uh, so in the time that we got the pipe, it stayed with us, this sacred pipe. And it was uh, a lot of the major uh, occurrences of, in the history of our people. Uh, and as we moved back towards the West, uh, we were somewhere right outside what is now uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota. There's a place there called Oruka Owapi, means uh, the sacred uh, stone formations and the drawings there. And so that is where we camped and that's where the Ocheti Shakoi was formed through the vision of a man. So uh, in, this, in this dream, the spirits took him to the Big Dipper. They formed it in a camp circle and they told him each one would have a certain name. So that's, he came back to earth and uh, the, what, what he dreamed at that time was written on those uh, petroglyphs outside of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul towards the Southwest. So, uh, but because it wasn't uh, protected, a lot of those drawings and stuff were uh, vandalized by people going there. So, but the, uh, the story of the, how the Ocheti Shakomi was carved on those rocks and way up high. So no one knows how they got carved there, but they know it wasn't done by humans. Uh, so those carvings are still there. And I don't know the English name to it or anything. This is just what my grandfather told me. So he said, Oruga Owapi, he calls it, where the sacred stones or the sacred rocks are, are written upon. So uh, that's where we formed Ocheti Shakomi and then we moved west gradually. It took us about Oh, maybe between 250 to 300 years to get back to the Black Hills. But we left from the Black Hills uh, uh, way back several hundred years before to the point of where the people forgot about the Black Hills. Uh, and then they said uh, there was a, a man, he, they said he had a dream and they called the Black Hills in his dream. Witapaha. And here some of the oldest people in the uh, village remembered the name, but they couldn't remember where it was at. So they told him to move west. Uh, everybody will gradually move west till they come back to the Black Hills. So uh, they, say, they said uh, to go and find the Witapaha, because that's where you originate from. That's where you come from. So we, we drifted to the east uh, to the point where uh, some areas of the Great Lakes in Michigan, that's where we went the farthest that way east. And then so, but it was a several hundred year uh, migration. So, uh, so the people forgot that about the Black Hills or that that's where they come from. So they found their way back eventually through a dream. And so uh, it is, it, we eventually made our way back into the Black Hills in the, uh, sometimes within the early 1700s, we made it back to the Black Hills. So the first uh, person that went back to the Black Hills was uh, a man named Standing Buffalo. And he took a war party and they went into there because there was other tribes there, Cheyennes, Ponkas, uh different tribes that were there so uh they had 
I guess several skirmishes while they were there. They had to fight several times, but they dug up a a, a spruce tree, which grow doesn't grow anywhere else unless it's planted. But it grows natural in the Black Hills, so they dug up a tree in in that war party. Took it back across the Missouri River to that area right southwest of uh, Minnesota, M Minneapolis, and Saint Paul. And they showed the people that we we found the Black Hills, and this is a tree from there. So that validated what they found because this, these trees grow nowhere, don't grow anywhere else, in, uh, like uh, naturally. Uh, so the Black Hills is full of these trees, but they don't. If you see one somewhere else, is because someone planted it. it. It didn't grow on its own. So the predictions that she made uh, came true uh, uh, that that all the things that we were going to see uh, was going to come true, and it did. Uh, we, the, we got the five ceremonies. We got the horses. Uh, and the pale people from the east came, like the, she predicted. And she told him that... Uh, that uh, the people there that there's a buffalo a spirit that stands in the uh west and each year it loses a hair and then every 100 years it loses a leg so she said that it's standing on the last leg and mostly all the hair is gone so when the last leg is gone and all the hair is gone she said there'll be a great purification that will come upon the earth. And so uh, we don't really know what it would be or what it's going to be, but it will be uh, something that, I guess, life-changing and it will change the direction of us as humans. You know? uh, and when you think about it, we're very insignificant in this world around us because uh, this world can survive, this country and this world can survive without us. If all the humans died away, then this this land will flourish. There'll be no more pollution. And it'll take maybe about 100 years or so, but, uh, you know, the buildings will be gone and the grass will come up and, you know, grow through the sidewalks and the, the world will change. Uh, it'll, the sky will become bluer. The waters real, will repurify and replenish themselves. The grass will grow really, really high like a long time ago. And the animals will flourish. The buffalo will probably break out of their pans and go all over the United States and, and multiply into the millions again like they did. And so... Uh, there, there, there might probably be no evidence of us ever being here uh, eventually. So uh, I always say that, you know, we put a lot of self-importance in ourselves as the two-legged or the human beings, but we're not really that important. And in fact, we're the ones that's damaging this earth. Uh, and this earth will do just fine without us, but because we put this self-importance on us that uh, this world can't survive without us and we have these ideas and so but we're badly mistaken in that sense because this world will do just fine without us there'll be no longer anybody here polluting this world this earth so whenever this purification comes uh, we don't know if we're going to be a part of it you know after it happens uh, and it really doesn't matter, you know, that even if we're not a part of it, it doesn't matter because we're the ones that's polluting the, the earth. So we lived here as indigenous people for thousands of years and, and we kept it the same. So when the people came here, you know, they, they should have asked us, well, how did you do that? So you kept the earth the way. That, that it was supposed to be like in the beginning. So uh, so anyway, that's that's the story of, of how it came to us and how to this day we still 
have the sacred pipe uh, and this, the pipe that is there now that's made of pipe stone. That was the first pipe that was made out of this stone. And, uh, and the one that's made from the buffalo leg of a calf uh, is still someplace. Uh, it's still there probably, but people aren't allowed to see it or, or whatever. But that's at the discretion of the, the man that takes care of the pipe today. So if he wants to, he'll show it to us. And if he doesn't, then there's nothing that we can really say. We can't force him. In. And he probably has the reasons for not showing it to us. Uh, maybe there's no people left that are good enough to look upon it. I don't know. But so that's the story of the coming of the sacred pipe. Oh, as they say, the old people who hatch it to yellow. Mm -hmm. Go on. Would you like to take a question? Maybe a couple, yeah. So there's a question, a couple questions in the chat. One says, does the coming of the white buffalo calf woman and the sacred pipe mark the first generation? So we are now in the time of the seventh generation? Mm, no, well, then there was generations before that. Uh, so we estimate around the year 1420, according to the winter count. Uh, but I think when they say the seventh generation, they're talking about when we were subjugated to move on to reservations. That's when they start counting the next seven generations. So we've always counted in seven generations. So that was the beginning of, of the next seven generations when we came onto the reservation. So that's what they're talking about. But according to the old men I've spoken to, of that count, we're only in the fifth generation. And there's a lot of people that uh, quote each other that we're in the seventh generation, but we're not. We still have another uh, two generations to go before we reach the seventh generation. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Lexi, for your time. Thank you for your teachings and your generosity. Mm, you're welcome. Mm. Did you have somebody that you wanted to close us out tonight? Mm, let's see. <laughs> 